Imagine a world without quilting. Now imagine a world without rocks. At first glance, these two things may be seemingly unrelated, but in fact, they're quite connected. Hi, my name is Donna Benito. I'm an avid quilter and a passionate geological engineer. And it was during the global pandemic that these seemingly two unrelated passions of mine collided in the most unexpected way. And what happened is two dear friends had made me quilt blocks showing how they had interpreted my photograph from a mine I had worked at. So here's the photo I took at the Holloway mine while supervising a drill. It rained and there was a beautiful rainbow over the head frame. And that made me think of the myth of finding a pot of gold because of course it was a gold mine. So I had to take a picture. And here are the quilt blocks. The one on the left was made by my dear friend, Donna Hudson Hironside, who worked at the mine site with me. And on the right, that was made by another dear friend, Carmen Huggins from Sudbury, Ontario. Carmen showed how the property looked before mining. And for me, I also interpret this as how it will look after the site is reclaimed. These blocks were pinned to my bulletin board in my sewing room next to a closet that contained an orange mini dress that had been on a silent auction table at a mining conference. That mini dress upset every female attendee, including me. And instead of having the organizers throw it in the garbage, I asked if I could have it. At that time, I had no idea why I wanted it. In March 2020, I was sent home from work due to COVID. Shortly after the COVID lockdown started, when I needed to get out my frustrations, I took to cutting that dress up into pieces. Then I was inspired to combine it with those quilt blocks so the fabric actually had a productive use. I wrote a poem, which I made into a wall hanging. I incorporated the zipper, reflective tape, and much of the orange fabric. And on the back, there are an old pair of coveralls. So this is a poem. We find, we mine, we improve tools, those connect us. Earth challenges us to find her treasures. Minor minds show Earth gratitude. Homes and food, water, medicine, gifts from Earth. I had been so scared to make a mistake with those precious blocks made by my friends, so they had been just sitting untouched for a few years. I like the results and it hangs in my office. That poem was longer, but in piecing all of those letters, it became more concise. That quilt made me realize that my job parallels my love of quilting. In mining, we break the rock into pieces so we can construct things. And that's kind of what we do with our fabric too in quilting. So anything that we use as humans, if the raw products are not grown, they must be mined. And this brings me to the goal of the presentation, which is to provide examples illustrating Earth's role in our quilting. There are video clips from other YouTube videos inserted into the comments below in case you want to check them out and learn more on a topic. In the mining industry, we often have safety shares. I'd like to share thoughts on how fortunate we are not to have lived during a time when the pigments we used in our work or our art form were actually life-threatening. The dangers associated with certain colors such as white, green, and orange have been successfully eliminated. So moving ahead, let's dive into cotton fabric, polyester, thread, equipment, energy, and water. First, let's take a closer look at cotton fabric and wool batting. Cotton needs fertilizer to grow. I happen to currently live in Saskatchewan, Canada, which is a major producer and exporter in the global potash industry. In 2018, we produced a staggering 21.5 million tons of potassium chloride. This accounts for about 31% of the world's total annual production of this pink and white crystalline rock. In the same year, the U.S. produced about 480,000 tons. Interestingly, while we don't fertilize sheep directly, they do consume food that may have been grown with fertilizers, which is why I'm connecting them to the topic of potash. Sheep provide the wool, such as for creating wool batting in this quilt I made. To me, it is remarkable how we have access to such diverse range of fabrics. Zoe Hong talks about fibers and how fabric is made. And I like that she mentions prepared for dyeing and prepared for printing fabric. 
I made a photo quilt before and I often print labels. Want to remember what the weft is? The weft runs left and then to right. So warp is the other way. Lots of other cool stuff in our video. Now let's circle back to cotton. It's practically everywhere in our lives and for a good reason. It is known for being soft, strong, and incredibly long lasting. I've included a link to a video below that describes the process of cotton growth. It is incredible to think that each cotton fiber is made of just one cell. A successful growing season and the application of science influence the quality of the cotton. Now let's shift our focus to plastics and polyester fibers, both of which are derived from petrochemicals sourced from crude oil and natural gas. Plastics find their way into various gadgets in our sewing world, from the body of sewing machines, rulers and spool threads, to stitch rippers, rotary cutters, tape measures, irons, and even in the tires on the cars we drive to get to our quilting stores and meetings. Polyester, on the other hand, is commonly used in threads and batting, and also for fleece that some of us use on the backs of our quilts. Now, speaking of crude oil, let's just touch upon the Alberta oil sands, which rank among the largest oil reservoirs in the world. The sand is black and rich in bitumen, a heavy and thick form of crude oil. These oil sands were formed when dead plants and animals got buried in sediments. Over time, heat and pressure cause the organic matter to transform into hydrocarbons that are then refined to create products we humans use in our daily lives. It's worth noting that in 2018, the United States was the world's largest crude oil producer at 15% of global production. Crude oil is found in underground rock formations and is also a product of ancient organic materials. Now there are many different types of battings as explained in the National Quilt Circles video. Some of these options incorporate polyester. Interestingly, we made progress in sustainability as it is now possible to recycle plastic bottles into polyester, reducing our reliance on solely extracting new petroleum-based raw materials directly from the earth. If you are curious about the process of making fleece, Mosal provides an informative explanation. Now let's move on to thread, which is a fundamental component of our quilts. Threads come from a variety of materials, including cotton, polyester, nylon, rayon, and for decorative purposes, even metals. It's intriguing how our planet provides us with the materials like aluminum, silver, gold, and copper. The metals may be wrapped around cores of cotton or silk and ornamental threads. Thanks to technological advancements, producers can now replicate the appearance of gold, making materials more cost effective. Speaking of gold, I have a soft spot for making recycled jean quilts. Fun fact, Levi Strauss invented jeans in the 1853 California Gold Rush to cater to the needs of prospectors. Both Canada and the United States remain significant global producers of gold. Gold is extracted through methods ranging from underground mining and open pit mining. Gold also plays a role in the technology we use for our quilting hobby, finding its way into our computers and phones. And let's not forget gold is currency, and it can be so hard to resist the temptation to splurge when we step into a quilting shop, at least for me. To help you gain a deeper understanding of how thread is made, I've included some videos below. It is so important to remember that the equipment used in thread production is predominantly crafted from metal, all sourced from the earth. Continuing our exploration of metals, it's fascinating to me to see how these materials find their way into so many of our tools. Metals are in our sewing machines and sewing feet, pins and needles, cutting blades and scissors, thimbles, irons, and ironing boards. They really are integral to our craft. Moreover, they're part of our everyday lives through our computers, cell phones, and cars. I included links to videos that explain both underground and surface mining. Among the common metals we encounter include stainless steel, brass, aluminum, copper, zinc, silver, and titanium. The choice of metals depends on factors including durability, cost, and aesthetic preferences. These metals are sourced from various rock formations, either through underground mining or open pit mining, before undergoing the transformation into steel. For those of us that like sewing with our sewing machines, I've come across an interesting video that explains how sewing machines work. It's fascinating to see how engineering has bridged the gap between knitting and machine stitching. It takes enormous machines to print fabric. And let's not forget about needles and pins, 
which are typically made of pure steel. It is truly remarkable to witness the craftsmanship behind the everyday items we often take for granted. And we also have to remember that many of these items were once part of our planet. Here I'm highlighting one particular mineral, which is copper. It is worth noting that copper has achieved the status of a critical mineral. If you're curious about why that is, I've attached a video for that too. When we talk about a critical mineral, it means that the mineral is crucial for industry to be able to produce the products our society relies on. For quilters, that could be the glitter in our threads, components of our cars, or the computer chips that power our sewing machines. Returning to the topic of colors, titanium dioxide is a key ingredient for achieving the color white. The compound is commonly abundant in the mineral rutile. Titanium dioxide is often included in the formulation of inks and pigments used to create patterns and images on fabric surfaces. In searching for more information on this subject, I stumbled across a video by Dr. Marty Jones in which he explores dyes, pigments, and our perspective of color. He conducts demonstrations including with beet juice and the rock hematite. This lunch talk would have been so fun to attend, so I'm glad the video was recorded. Energy plays a crucial role in various aspects of quilting. Not only do our sewing machines require it, but even when we engage in hand sewing, we rely on energy for proper lighting. In terms of energy sources, coal contributes to approximately 6% of electricity generation in Canada and 20% in the United States. Uranium, on the other hand, accounts for about 15% of electricity in Canada and 18% in the USA. Additionally, we draw energy from a diverse range of sources, including natural gas, petroleum, wind, hydropower, solar, biomass, and geothermal. For those interested in delving deeper into energy sources, I included links to videos on Coal 101 and How Uranium is Made, which offer valuable insights and other information. Water plays an indispensable role in the world of quilting. We use it to wash our fabric, it is used in our irons, and it is incorporated in the manufacturing process of fabric and equipment. Moreover, water is essential for irrigating the fields that grow our cotton and the plants used in dye production. We also drink it, and on occasions, like quilting cruises, we even get to float on it while attending quilting classes. In closing, I sincerely hope that this video bridged the connection between the earth and quilting. I believe that quilting offers opportunities that align with environmentally friendly practices. Personally, I love creating recycled jean quilts, repurposing parts of old jeans that could be salvaged from the jeans that can no longer be worn. I've also been trying to use up some of my fabric stash, which not only conserves resources, but also sparks my creativity. It is worth noting that just as my journey was inspired by a photograph, many quilters draw their inspiration directly from nature. The beauty of the earth's colors, patterns, and textures often find their way into quilt fabrics or quilt designs, making quilting an art form that is deeply rooted in the natural world. I hope this video showed that quilting wouldn't be possible without rocks. I encourage you to explore the videos in the links below to learn more about how quilting supplies are made.